And that's what we're really teaching people is how do you get your clients and employees to go sell and be inspired to, not because they're being rewarded or commissioned, but because they want to. When you can shift that and inspire somebody's heart versus trying to like make it a, a transactional relationship, game over. Welcome, everybody, to The Chris Harder Show, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success, knowing that when good people like you make good money, they can then do great things. My name is Chris Harder, and several times per week, I will bring you epic guests, solo episodes, and every single tool, trick, and skill set you need to grow your business, grow your money mindset, and to grow your wealth to levels that you have never reached before. I've ended up in a unique place in life where I've got the experience, the connections, and all of the secrets that it takes to be successful. And I'm lifting the curtain to reveal it all to you in an effort to help put you in a position of abundance so great that you can then be as generous as possible. So let's lock arms and let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Chris Harder Show. I'm sitting down and having a great conversation about generosity and gifting in particular by the author of Giftology, John Rulin. Now, John is literally known in the highest of circles as the greatest gift giver in the world. And it's not because of what he gives, but it's because of the meaning and the timing and the thought that he wraps into it. And I think this episode is going to help make every single one of us a better gift giver. So whether you're trying to give out gifts to clients or whether you're trying to give out gifts to your loved ones, your friends, I know I personally always want to be a better gift giver. And that's exactly what this episode has helped me do in getting to know John a little bit. Now, John's a great guy. He's the founder of the Ruling Group and uh, Giftology. And it's really just this great company that helps huge corporations like the Cubs and Wells Fargo and Caesars Palace and Miami Dolphins, John Maxwell Company, you name it. It helps them give better gifts, not just to their clients, but also to their employees. And he's got a really cool, unique approach to building relationships that has really led him to build a a group of friends, a circle of influence that is second to none. We're talking like Gary Vee and and Lewis Howes and John Maxwell and so many other incredible, great human beings out there that he gets to call friends, all because he is always led with generosity and expected nothing in return. So I feel like this episode number one is going to inspire you to be even more generous. Number two, it's going to teach you a few things about gift giving that will make you a better gift giver. And number three, leave you feeling really, really good about just good things that people are doing in the world to cause good positive chain reactions. And I promise there's some good business lessons in here as well that are also going to boost your business. Now, before we dive into this, I want to remind you, speaking of generosity and giving gifts, Lori and I have partnered with our good friend, Dean Graciosi, who is Tony Robbins' business partner. And he and Tony are doing their largest act of generosity of the year, their largest gift giving, so to speak, of the year. And that is they are doing the Own It 64 Challenge, five free days of training on how to come up with your message, package it, monetize it, and market it. I mean, they're the best of the best in the world at helping people do this. And so if you want to get your message out there, Maybe you're just like John, who we're about to interview, and you want to get your message of gifting and generosity out there and monetize it and get paid for your good message. If you want to do that, there's no strings attached. There's no hidden agenda. There's nothing other than five great days of training. Everything from how to think of your idea to how to build it, package it, and market. If you want to learn from Tony Robbins, if you want to learn from Dean Graciosi and so many other incredible trainers, Go to ownit64.com and register for free. Their goal is to get 1 million people in this free training for five days. Talk about generous. Each of them charge thousands for their virtual trainings. This is a virtual training for five days in a row for totally free. It's their biggest giving initiative of the year. Go join it. Lori and I are doing it. We're learning from them. Ownit64.com. O-W-N-I-T 64.com. Come join us. You won't regret it. All right, guys, get ready because this episode is going to pull out that inner generosity in you and leave you feeling amazing. All right, John. Well, listen, welcome to the show, number one. Number two, it's been a long time coming. 
longer than I would have liked. So sorry for the delays and booking and all that stuff. But I'm glad we're finally connecting today. Yeah, man. Well, you had a few things going on. I got four kids and travel and whatever else, and you moved to a new city. So it's, uh, you know, timing is uh, when it's supposed to be. I, you know what? I, I I agree with that statement. It really is, right? Everything is the exactly the way it's supposed to be. And I think 2020 was just a giant timing mess for everybody anyway. So everybody kind of gets a, gets a hall pass there. Amen. I love yeah. it. Now, John, yeah. I forget, where are you located? Are you in Ohio? Uh, originally, for 30 years, Ohio, but I live in just outside of St. Louis, although I went to Austin with my wife and four daughters and rented for five months to see if we want to move there. Uh, we're also checking out Franklin outside of Nashville. So I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm just outside of St. Louis currently. Okay, not that the listeners are going to care about this, but offline, I have got the hookup on the inside and all that. So Lori and I just moved from Santa Monica to Scottsdale area. And Franklin, Tennessee was like top of the list, checked it out. We have good friends that live there. Um, Austin, top of the list, spent 10 days there house shopping and chose this area. So I've got a lot of insight into that. Uh, not that you asked for it, but in case you need anybody help no, make, I, making I, that decision. Yeah. The more, the better. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's such a crazy market. And yeah, I was just in Scottsdale speaking for EO last week. Uh, they had about 180 entrepreneur members of that group. And uh, I was in your backyard here at... Um, Oh, uh, which hotel was it? Really cool hipster kind of sixties era hotel in Scottsdale. Oh, I'm probably the, the the Valley Ho. Yes. Yep. I, I stayed I stayed at the Valley Ho, hung out at the little bar there. My buddy Scott Donald came and we uh, we enjoyed some good tequila and bourbon there. Um, but I love. I have some great friends in and around Scottsdale. It's just such a great, uh, especially you know the weather year round, except for maybe the hot, the heat in the summer. But in general, it's like, wow, it's amazing. I haven't experienced it yet, but I've heard there's 90 days where you just don't want to be here. The rest of it, pretty good. Yeah. So nine months, three months, you go travel to Michigan or Maine yep. or somewhere yeah. else and call it a day. It's going to be Wisconsin for us. So I'm Wisconsin born and raised. And, and, and this is why I asked where you are as fellow Midwesterner here. And, and I just think that there's such a cool upbringing when you come from the Midwest. Some of the Great family values, work ethic, um, you know, kind, kind driven people come from there. And then when you can take that and, and go mix it up out in the, the real world, you know, I know that you just uh, hung up with Gary Vee and his team and, and you do a lot of work. I saw you uh, with my friend Lewis Howes on the West Coast. When you can bring those great Midwest values to the coasts and mix it up, I feel like that's the perfect mix for being successful in business. Yeah, it's a nice hybrid for sure. It's like you want, it's fun to have access to cool, sexy things, but if it's not grounded and rooted in good values or you know foundational um, you know faith or elements, then I think sometimes it can get uh, maybe a little bit too off kilter with success or other things. So yeah, I mean, I got four little girls to think about raising, and so keeping them rooted and grounded and not forgetting where they came from uh, is definitely at the top of the list. Top of the list for sure. Okay, so you're a professional gift giver, for lack of any better description than that. And people are going to hear that. They're going to be like, well, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. How in the world did you end up as being known as the professional gift giver? Yeah, well, so, so what, I, what I give as a caveat to that, because sometimes people are like, well, you get to play Santa Claus and, or you get to do swag. Um, or like, I mean, at the end of the day, most people, unless you're on the receiving end and your love language is gifts, nobody cares about gifts in business. People think it's like a check the box thing. Like, oh, at Christmas or I signed a big deal. I should send a gift. Really, it's I, I don't even care about gifts. My love language is words of affirmation. So the core of the gifting is really relationships, relationships with clients, employees, partners, investors, mentors. Like every business rises and falls on that. We we do the professional gifting side because I was an a introverted farm kid who was milking goats, and I didn't have access to influencers. I didn't have access to CEOs. I didn't have I didn't hang out at country clubs in LA or you know pro sports teams. So. The, the way I learned what I learned was an early mentor when I was 20, getting ready to go to med school, was this attorney. And he was like a rainmaker, but he was super generous. And so when you grow up poor, you notice when people are generous, right? And you see it like, oh my gosh, that's, there's a big gap there. And, um, and so he would, like, he'd find a deal on noodles and buy like a semi load. And everybody at church the next Sunday would walk away with like 20 cases. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing the math. I'm like, that's like 40 grand. I asked Paul, I'm like, why? And he's like, did you see their smiles? And, and so it wasn't tactical for Paul. It's just who he was. Mm -hmm. So I looked at Paul. Actually, I was interning with Cutco at the time. And I, uh, so I'm selling these expensive knives. I have no sales experience. 
So I pitched Paul the idea of giving away pocket knives. All his clients are men, they're in the Midwest, outdoors, hunting, fishing. And um, and he did, he's like, John, I don't want to order, these are like $200 pocket knives. He's like, I don't order pocket knives, but I'll order pairing knives. I'm like, why? And he changed my life forever and put me on this whole tra- different trajectory by, he's like, John, the reason I have more referrals, deal flow, access, is I found out if you take care of the family, everything else takes care of itself. Wow. So I was like, I, even then I was, I realized it wasn't about the stupid knives. Although to this day, we still do millions of dollars in knives. It, the knife was the delivery vehicle for an emotion. It wasn't about the item. It wasn't, there's no logos on it. It was the person's name. It was like, it was a, it wasn't swag. It wasn't trinkets. It wasn't a carrot and stick. If you do this, you get this. It was a true gift. And so I saw, I wanted to be Paul. So I started just to mimic what I saw him doing. And and what's funny is if you work your gratitude muscle for 21 straight years, anybody, and I mean anybody, even if your love language is in gifting, you can become very good at it because a lot of it is just intentionality. It's focus. It's putting your money where your mouth is. It's follow through. It's consistency. I'm not, you know, like I grew up milking goats, literally like one of six kids, 47 acres, like for real, not like, oh, out in the country, like for real, like town of 417 people. So when people are like, John, how'd you become the best gift giver on the planet? I'm like, I've just been really one of the few people that have been working on how to use generosity and gratitude as this competitive advantage because I, it was came out of insecurity and out of like being this country bumpkin. And so, you know, you do something long enough, you become pretty good at it. It's amazing. So you're saying that we can actually take our, our generosity muscle and we can develop it like any other skill set, like any other muscle in the world, if we're intentional about working at it. 100%. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's how God's whether you believe in a God or not. I I believe human beings were tribal. You know, that God's wired into us. Like if you, you know, like Proverbs eighteen sixteen says, a gift ushers you before kings. Mm. Like so, I didn't invent these concepts. I just have kind of like packaged like five thousand year old wisdom and, and <clears throat> into it. You know, an, a version in twenty twenty or twenty twenty one that people can understand and relate to and put metrics to it and. All the stuff that we want as business leaders or as owners or as, as you know, leaders in general, as human beings. So, so yeah, I mean, if you, you know, I tell people like I'll get, you know, we spoke at this big event in, uh, in not now, in Kauai a couple of years ago. It was all financial advisors, wealth managers, all that kind of stuff. And one of the guys came up to me afterwards. And these are all seven-figure guys. He's like, hey, can you help me with my wife and I's 50th anniversary is coming up? And I'm like, no. Like, you should have been thinking about this for the last 50 years. You should have been listening. Like anybody can be a great gift giver. If they, you know, I said, if, if you put even like one tenth as much time into this as you did your fantasy football league, yeah. you would be a great gift giver. But most people think it's a woo woo, warm, fuzzy, who cares? And they don't realize that if you, if you suck at gift giving, what you really do is you're giving a tangible form of telling somebody that they don't matter. That's not a great. Like if you want to be a leader of influence, you better be good at honoring people and appreciating people and making somebody feel at this deep visceral level something. And if you do, guess what? Relationships flourish. If you suck at that, then they don't. I don't care if it's a billion dollar client or a twenty thousand dollar client. Like we're all just human beings. This is amazing. So one of my big takeaways right away is this idea of gift giving. They can't just come to you and say, "Hey, bail me out. Give me a really good gift idea for my wife, for my partner, for my." Um, you know, client, gift giving is a result of actually caring about and being present with people over the long term, so that you know what would mean something to them. Is is what you're saying? Yeah. I, so, so I think the what's interesting is personally the the benchmark is so much higher for your spouse, your parents, yeah, your kids, people that know you intimately. Like, you know, it's one thing for me to give a gift in business. I I can do the same gift to 10,000 people in business and help a company outsource their gifting and like hit the bullseye almost every single time. I can you know do scaling thoughtfulness. But when you take it into a one-to-one, just your spouse, like they know your tendencies, your, your strengths, your weaknesses, your hacks. Like when I have to gift my wife as the giftology guy, like I have to bring, like she is the most difficult person on the planet because she knows everything about me and I know everything about her. And she can tell if I held back. She can tell if I cut corners. She can tell. And I think most, I think women's EQ in general, just naturally how they're wired, like they're better at the details of relationship building because they are more thoughtful. And not, not, you know, this is a broad brush stroke, but in general, they're more thoughtful, 
They're more aware. They care about details. They understand the handwritten note matters. They understand the packaging matters. Like a lot of guys, the typical type A, like doer guys, like, can I just outsource this and check the box and be done with it and throw some cash at it? And it's like, sometimes you can kind of, but you still have to bring the warmth and the element. And it's like when I we just had the opportunity to interview Sarah Blakely and Jesse, and she talks about like the balance of feminine and masculine en- energy really is like, if you want to be great at business, you need to have both. Mm-hmm. And most of the time in business, it's all masculine. And there's a handful of people that's all feminine, but it's the blend of both of those that really allows you to be able to connect with somebody. It's like, it's not bad to have goals and run through walls and all that, but most people don't balance that with the other side because it seems like the awkward, like you want to become a better gift giver. Like nobody wakes up and doing their miracle morning at 4 a.m., being like gifting at the top of the list because they don't realize the leverageability and the impact of it and what that really, really is. Man, I love this. Okay, so I want to back up a minute because I definitely want to find out how you built this company brick by brick. But long before that, you were grown up in the Midwest, milk and goats, like you said, and you just got done explaining that gifting and generosity is a muscle that we can build. So did you have this natural tendency to be generous as a kid growing up in the Midwest or was it truly this mentor that opened your eyes to this miraculous feeling of being generous and you took it and grew it from there? Yeah, I didn't have it. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say I was... Yeah, you know, I think some people are maybe more wired, more generosity or more you know, stingy or limited mindset. I've always like kind of... I've been able to think about and figure out angles on things. I've always been an overachiever. But I mean, I grew up working hard, splitting wood, he, you know, we had a one acre garden. Like I grew up with blue, more blue collar work ethic of like, you just do whatever it takes. Um, you know, I, I got cut from the basketball team and like bowled my eyes out and like went and talked the coach back into getting on the team. Like, I feel like there's been a number of hurdles, like things haven't been just like given to me. But I, I wouldn't say generosity. If I, you would ask me like, what am I good at? Or what are my core values with growing up? Being kind. You know, like that, that was important being, I, I definitely am somebody who likes to be liked. Like my tendency is to be a pleaser. Like that's my normal wiring. But I would say that I just saw in Paul and some of my early mentors, like how, when they were generous and how they showed up for people, how people responded to them and took their phone call and how calm Paul, like Paul had got to lunch with me for two or three hours and was never really stressed. And I just was, I just looked at that and said, you know, you just, can, you're drawn in when you see somebody a certain way and you start, at least for me, I start to dissect and say, how did he get there? What does that look like? What are the things he's doing? And I'm really good at modeling uh, something. So I, I wouldn't say I was born this way. Um, I was born with certain tendencies that maybe have played well, or I've leveraged, you know, like me, like most people would say being introverted is a, is a, a good thing. Cause I, now I'm speaking on big stages and it takes a lot of energy to go do that and kind of play an extrovert on stage. Yeah. But I think it's also like I wouldn't have gotten good at gifting if I had been an extrovert because I just would have went and talked to the person. Yeah. Um, I used the gifting to get them to come talk to me. And so I think anytime you can take your weaknesses and say, hey, how do I use that as a strength? Uh, I think it's, you know, like at least for me, that's been something I've been good at. That's really, really brilliant. I'm an introvert as well, by the way. So it's, pro- I, I'm just now realizing uh, my generosity, uh, gifting, the things that I lead with a lot of times is a coping mechanism, not a bad one, right? If you're going to have one, what a great one to have. But it is a bit of a coping mechanism to develop relationships and keep relationships as someone who really just likes to be at home with his wife. And so it's fascinating. I'm just learning this about myself and and this tendency and and where a lot of this comes from um, in hearing you explain that. Okay, so Paul, that was your mentor. He changed your life, obviously, got you down this this road of, of... understanding gratitude and, and how it can create relationship capital, something we talk a lot about on the show. When did building your company come into play? How'd you go from mentor teaching you that generosity matters to you now being the leading expert in corporate gift giving? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you know, like a lot of things, things start out of desperation, right? Like just the practical nature. I was, I was at a private Christian university, liberal arts, you know, 15 grand a year, which 20 years ago was a lot of money. Yeah. Still a lot of money, but it's, it was but back then it felt like a million dollars a year. Which and I didn't want to take any debt out. Uh, Malone University. Okay. I went to St. Norbert. So it sounded like you're describing the same tuition, same everything. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, small liberal arts, NAI, D2, like mm-hmm. small, yep. 3,000 students, you know, total, even with like commuters and stuff. 
So I, I just wanted to pay for med school. So when I interned with Cutco, the knife company, it was like, if I can just sell a bunch of knives, then I can make enough money to pay for college. And so that was the impetus. But then when I saw Paul and I was like, instead of selling one knife set, to him, I sold a hundred and you know, a hundred gifts. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, like nobody's like I realized that what Paul was doing naturally was not being done intentionally with companies. And if you called a company and say, Hey, I want to talk to you about my knives, you would get click. But if you got the person who you sold knives to to reach out to their CEO buddy owned a company and was struggling with referrals or retention or access or engagement or whatever, and you got them to open the door for you. And then you went in and, and like sent them this crazy gift with the knives with this, you know, maybe his wife's name or her husband's name and their logo. If you if you got them to experience what I was talking about, they'd be like, I, normally we do like fruit baskets or honey baked hams or gift cards or bonuses or like swag trinkets, all the same crap. Or we do dinners at Morton's or we do golf or we like everybody. What I realized was that everybody in business does the exact same stuff to build relationships. It's just copying everybody else. And because of it, it's a very noisy area. Most people do gifting at like, they'll do their dinner at a Ritz Carlton level and then they do their gifting at a Motel 6 level. Oh, wow. And they wonder why it doesn't work. Wow. That's true. So when I took a $20 budget and showed them how they could invest $250 or $500 or $5,000 in something that was different and would have 100 times more impact, they're like, all of a sudden I started to get orders for knives that were like $100,000 when their average order was like $200. That's incredible. And, 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 and Cutco's mind, they thought it was fraud at first. <laughs> but by the time, they, they literally like flagged that I was getting called. And Cutco's a $300 million company. I'm getting calls from the CFO saying, did you steal a credit card? What did you do? And so early on, the first three years of selling Cutco was just the idea of like, can I sell enough to pay for college and graduate debt free and go to med school? And, and towards my senior year, I realized like, why would I go a quarter million dollars in debt to be a doctor when I really wanted to be a doctor? It, I, be candid, it was to make money. Yeah. Like I got good grades and I could go make money and not be poor anymore. Yep. So I'm like, why not try this business thing? This entrepreneur, I, I didn't know what an entrepreneur was going into college. And then you start to hear about it a little bit. And Cutco's, you know, the personal development of Cutco's worked with about 2 million reps. And like Travis Kalanich, who started Uber, guess what his first job was? Cutco. Selling that. Wow. Al Elrod, Miracle Morning sold 3 million bucks. Guess what? Is the, we, we grew up together 20 years in Cutco because it's a personal development company that happens to have a great knife yeah. component around it. So all that to say, like I realized for my senior year, why don't I just try this business thing? And I never really talked about myself as being a knife salesperson. I was really, I was a business owner. I was teaching people about referrals and access. And I, I realized early on. So that was the impetus. It was like, I'm just going to take the leap and worst case scenario, I go like I built this network of all these business owners that I'll go sell something or go I'll start another business yeah. or get a chat to all the back to med school. Yeah, easily. Yeah. That was 20 years ago and I never looked back. Okay, so at that point, did you just go all in on Cutco or at that point did is that when you started Giftology Group? Uh, I didn't call it Giftology at the time. It's called even when I first was just selling knives, it was called the Ruin Group. Why? Because I felt insecure calling it and I group like made me feel like even though it was me and an yeah. assistant, you know, like there's that insecurity, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. And even though knives was the only thing we sold, I didn't talk about knives until the very end. Like people didn't really care about what the thing was. Once they got the context of like, if I can invest a dollar and make $20 back on referrals and access and whatever else, people don't care what the delivery vehicle is. They just want to keep in a relationship or open a door or get referrals. And so when I showed them, through just modeling it, I started to invest as I was a college kid at 20. I started investing $500 a month in gifts. Wow. All nice. So if I wanted to get a meeting with a CEO of a $200 million insurance company, I'd buy a couple of knives from Cutco, it was like 400 bucks. I'd engrave the CEO's name, spouse's name, and I put a little handwritten note, carve out five minutes for me. I promise you, worth your time. And then I'd get the meeting. And then I'd walk in in like the one suit I have in like the mahogany boardroom, like the typical like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, like kind of thing. And I'd be sweating bullets. I'm so nervous. The CEO's like, who is uh, your kid? Well, I thought you'd be 55 seasoned sales executive. What are you doing here? And I'd be like, I'm the John Willing setting the knives. And his jaw would hit the ground. And he'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, seriously, you sent me that nice gift? 
said, yes, sir. You know, you know, you know, he's asking me questions like, are you here to sell me knives? I'm like, no, I'm here to help you and your thousand sales reps do exactly what I did to you to your top 10,000 relationships. Wow. That's where the first you know, six-figure deal started to come from um, was they, they started to realize like, oh my gosh, nobody cares about knives. Nobody cares about gifts, but we all like need to move people emotionally. And if you can do something unique, different, weird, cool, memorable, include their spouse, include their assistant. Like we started to get referred into NASCAR, which led to the NFL, which led to the NBA. So people are like, like, what's the journey here? It's like, well, you know, we just ate our own dog food. The $500 a month budget went up to a thousand dollars a month, which as a college kid, a thousand dollars a month in gifts, 12 grand a year is a lot of freaking money. Yeah. A ton. And so when somebody like I, we get these entrepreneurs all the time or authors like, Oh, John, I'd love to work with you, but you can only work with the Cubs. And I'm like, most of our businesses that we work with are like million dollar to hundred million dollar companies. It's not the Googles, although we have worked with Google, like it's the people who are the David going up against Goliath. And most people would rather go spend 50 grand on Facebook ads versus investing 50 grand in the relationships they already have to go do something that inspired them to go act on their behalf. And so a lot of our conversations are reframing and showing people they really do have the dollars if they want to choose you know, to look at, you know, ROI is one thing. I like ROR. Return on relationship will always oh, be I love that. the typical social media and Facebook and all that. Like, I don't have the biggest following in the world uh, on social, but what I do have is relationships that are willing, like ones that you couldn't get for $5 million for one relationship will go and they've been inspired to go sell on my behalf. And that's what we're really teaching people is how do you get your clients and employees to go sell and be inspired to, not because they're being rewarded or commissioned, but because they want to. When you can shift that and inspire somebody's heart versus trying to like make it a, a transactional relationship, game over. John, I love that. So uh, now fast forward to today. What are the most common, what are the most popular gifts that you give uh, on behalf of corporate gifts? Yeah. So um, we, we got this question three years ago from the New York Times. John, what's the hot, sexy gift? That was their question. And I laughed and I said, the stupid knives. Huh. And they said, come on, that was like your college student thing 21 years ago. And I said, people still in 2020 or 2018, they still break bread. Yep. They still have like, you know, where people spend most of their time and most of their money in their home, yep. the kitchen. Literally in the kitchen. Sub zero fridges, wolf stoves, you know, beautiful, car- like most people drop like on a really nice house, it might be a hundred thousand, a million dollar kitchen. Yep. And I'm like, where do people gather with this? People that are the most important. They, they have food and wine and drink and they celebrate in the help of the house, the kitchen. So the knives, you know, whether it's one knife for a couple hundred dollars and you, you know, like most people would never go buy a $200 knife for themselves. So engraved with their name or their favorite verse, if they're a person of faith, all the way up to, you know, the gift that we sent to Tony Robbins on behalf of a client was like an $8,000 set of knives. And on all 40 knives inside this crazy $2,500 box was 40 or 80 quotes of wisdom Tony had spoken into the world over the last 40 years. So he could buy his own, he could buy 10,000 knife sets, but Sage, his wife, when she saw the engraving was like, this is one of the most thoughtful, it's like an heirloom now. It's like, because of the meaning that's woven into it. Most people focus on the what, Mm -hmm. what am I going to give? What, how much should I spend? What's cool? What's going to make me look cool? And when we walk people through a process, I don't care if you're a solopreneur or or you're Google, my focus is who are you giving to? Yeah. What's important to them? What's their inner circle? Like, what's the value of this relationship? So like our playbook of like what we take people through, your tribe could go download and go steal and use because I want people to do this. They don't have to hire our agency to do it. They can do it themselves. They go to giftologysystem.com. They can download our whole blueprint of who they should be focused on, how much should they invest, what the timing should be so it's a surprise and delight versus a tip for tap transactional thing. And so for us, it's not the what. The what might still be the knives. Yeah. But most people will say, I'm doing giftology and it's not working. And I'm like, it's because you're not following the recipe. You're focusing on the what, not the who, not the timing, not the handwritten note. And so like, I'm like, imagine baking bread 100,000 times thinking you're like, why am I not getting bread? Well, you didn't put yeast in. Yeah. I don't care how many times you bake it. Like if you don't put the little things in that make something feel a certain way, then you're not doing giftology. You're doing giftology-ish. Yeah. There is a recipe. And so the core of what we're talking about, like we do, I used to make fun of mugs and then this person made a $1,000 mug for me. 
What? And it's a thousand bucks. I, I, I thought it was like, I used to make fun of them, like corporate coffee mug or the water bottle, the dumbest gifts. Yeah. You can only drink out of one. They're made, made out in China with the logo. This artist made one for me and one for my wife, a grand each. Carved into it is my core values, my life story, tragedies overcome, faith, my kids. It made me cry. My wife was like hard to gift for. She, she bawled and I bawled. And I gifted about 130 of these in the last three years, wow. personally. My mentors, some of who have $50,000 watches, yeah. are like, John, if I had to choose between my watch and, your, and, the, and the artifact mug, so it's called artifact mug, I would choose the mug. And here's why. This watch, it burned up in a, you know, my house is on fire. I'll just get a new one. The insurance will cover it. The mug reminds me, there's a story attached to that. There's, it's personal. It reminds me every day as I bring my coffee or tea. It's not made to sit on a shelf. It's made to be used. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of what matters. And the story behind it, it makes it like something I grab in a fire. Wow. And, and so it's not about going and buying $25,000 Louis Vuitton bags and like outspending. Nobody's going to outspend their publicly traded competitor. Yep. But you can be more thoughtful. You can be more unique and more creative in how you show up for people. And, and gifting is just one of those ways that we found that the bar is so low. People do it. They suck at it. And they, they either think they're good and they've never been told like, you know, how people really feel about their gifts or they're not thinking strategically about it. And it's just this check the box thing at Christmas because they feel guilty. They made money this year. Oh, we should probably send something. I'm like, Christmas is the worst time to send a gift because it's, you're competing against 40 other gifts they're showing up. Say thank you and love on people year round. Like this is a, like you don't tell your kids to be, set, you know, use please and thank you once a year. You tell them to be thoughtful and polite year round. It's a way of life. Why are we waiting? Like, you know, you're married, I'm married. If I show up for my wife on anniversaries, I say no ABC gifts again, no anniversaries, no birthdays and Christmas. Why? Because if you show up at only those times, that's, that's table stakes. That's expected. It gets you at like even. Whereas if you show up for relationships, not because you need something or because they did something, it's just because. Now the other person's like, I didn't give you a referral. I didn't do a deal with you. Like, why are you sending me this? Just because? Just because of me being in relationship with you? Now, like that gift, whatever it is, has a hundred times more impact because it's not a manipulation. It's not a expected. It's a, I was thinking of you. I love that. And so that shifts everything over giving a cool gift. I love this whole concept behind your giftology system and the why, the when, the meaning, all of that behind the gift is what makes the gift, not the thing. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and I think that's a giant shift for people to realize. Talk to me about the law of reciprocity, right? This idea of if I give something, one day I'll get something back. Talk to me about the law of reciprocity and how that fine line between, um, doing it in a scammy way, hoping for something in return one day and doing it because it's who you are and maybe it just happens to pay you back because that's the way the world works. Yeah. So what I would say, I mean, Vaynerchuk's a great example of this. We talked about this on this marketing for the now is most people give to get. Mm -hmm. And you know, that his book was jab, 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 right hook. Yep. It wasn't jab, right hook. Yep. And it wasn't like the jab was the give. The right hook is the ask. If you ask with expectation, it's like if you're a wife, you do something nice, you know, for Lori, and then like five minutes later, you expect something. It wasn't a gift. It was a manipulation. Wow. What, whereas if you give with an open palm, like I'm not, this isn't woo woo warm. Like, yeah. like the goal in business is to make money and provide for your family and profit's not a bad word, but it, it like the way that the world's wired, faith-based or not, like the, there's certain universal truths, whether you believe in a God or not. And one of them is if you can you know, like if you continue to pour into relationships, whether it's through them or some other channel, it will come back to you over time. That's where people like they ruin it. They they like they think they're playing the long game. They're like, I've been doing this for 47 days. I'm like, the long game is decades, not days. Yeah, yep. And so if you show up for relationships, I tell people don't don't do giftology, whether it's through us or on your own unless you commit for a minimum of three years. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to do this and, and expect something in three months or six months that's unreasonable. And you're going to actually spend money to ruin the relationship. And when you do it that way, like you can give and give and give and say, hey, I hope I'm going to get referrals. I would love to get this. 
But if you put those expectations on the other person, they will feel it yep. and you'll damage the relationship or you'll be like daddy Warbucks, like, Oh, I'm doing all these amazing things. And then like you go back to being Ebenezer Scrooge and people are like, Oh, that wasn't for real. That was just like the flavor of the month thing that he did or yeah. she did. So it needs to be like mindset, heart set. If this is who I want to show up as profit's not a bad word. I am going to do it strategically. I might, I might not treat if I have a hundred relationships or a thousand relationships, I might narrow things down to my, you know, either the top 50 that have gotten me here or the 50 I want to invest into the next 10 years. But it's the frame of reference that you're looking at that determine whether or not you're going to ruin the relationship or like make the relationship flourish. And a lot of it is in the details of like, am I given this to get this or am I going to continue to pour into these people? And, and oftentimes, here's the fun thing. You have a million dollar company. Because everything, I, I, my the business partner is a CFO. Like he's like, you know, like we have to manage the numbers. Bottom line, bottom line. Bottom line, bottom line. But he's also generous. He's one of the most generous personally, but in business, he's frugal. Mm-hmm. He's like a Ronald Reagan, Warren Buffett kind of dude. Like he's just like super conservative, but he's in his personal life, he's, he, he actually dwarfs me in generosity. Wow. It's, it's like impressive. But the, the goal is if you make, say you have a million dollar revenue company and you profited a hundred grand. Our rule of thumb is you should reinvest five to fifteen percent of net. So if you netted out a hundred grand, that would be five to fifteen grand. People are like, man, that's a lot of money. I'm like, you get to keep eighty five grand, and the relationships you, they're basically buying their own gifts. Yep, you're reinvesting profits back into relationships to keep them, to grow them. And the secret sauce is if you do this well, like you know, Cameron Harold's a client. He's written like six books. We poured into him probably over a decade, twenty five grand. Wow. You're like, it's a lot of money. I'm like, I can tie over the last decade, seven over seven figures to that one relationship. Return on relationship, 50x. Wow. You can't compete with that. So it, it, it should be a thoughtful, it's not just, it's, it's like that balance of tension of like generosity, but also strategic in the middle. If you do, if you, you know, walk that fine line of pouring into people without expectation over three years and 10 years. And a lot of us are going to be in business for decades, yeah. right? Yep. So if you let that play out, like to get on Vaynerchuk's show, it took six years. Yep. I never asked Gary to be on the show. So it wasn't like eventually after being strategic and generous or whatever else, you know, things started to align and now like they're a client and now they're asking me to teach their company and like, but it took six years of pouring into that relationship. And most people give up after six days or six months. Like, this doesn't work. And I'm like, you, uh, you don't understand. You, it's cool. It's like we talked about before the, you know, the recording. Everybody says they're a giver. Most people are matchers. And most people say they play the long game, but really like their long game is a short game. Yeah, and people smell that and they feel that. And especially the, the higher quality relationships that you want, they're even more guarded about. And I think you have an even higher EQ just because they have experienced it before on who's giving to get and who is truly just trying to add value to their life with no expectations and has no attachment to when or if something comes back to them. I, and those are the people that I want in my life, right? Those are the individuals that I want to give to and that I want giving to me. So that you mentioned Cameron Harold real quick. I want you to tell the story if you don't mind. Um, you got to know him in a really creative way. And, and most people don't know he's the founder of Got Junk. I think that was the big company he built and sold. Uh, along with being, you know, a strategic CEO and investor in so many other big companies. Yeah, but yeah, he was CEO when it went from two million to one hundred twenty-seven million. So he didn't even own it. Wow! But he was the guy who, with no outside investment, no venture capital, no debt, was the leader of operations. All the PR, getting on Oprah, all of that was him. Unheard of. Okay, so years ago, I don't know how long it. I'll let you fill that in. Um, you wanted to get to know him, and you did it in a really creative way. Do you mind sharing that story quick? Yeah. So I met him at the EO event. My first EO event, he was speaking and it was like, like I almost didn't go to the breakout because I was like a junk company. I didn't, I hadn't heard of it. It was 14 years ago. Just joined, heard him speak. And, and like made, you know, a lot of people, like when they meet somebody or hear somebody speak, they're like, man, everything that's coming out of that person's mouth is gold. I want to build a relationship that's not, I can't afford his like $20,000 a month coaching, but I want him to be a friend, a mentor, all this stuff. And so I went up afterwards and said, Hey, I hear you're coming to Cleveland, which is where I was living at the time, to speak to our EO chapter. And I looked at the calendar and I was like, The night before, I have lower level seats to the opening game of you know, Cavs with LeBron. We'll go to a Morton's dinner. I'm thinking we'll have this bro session. We'll like 
build this relationship. And when I asked him to go, it was the most underwhelming response ever. He said, I guess I'll go. Nothing else is going on. And in my head, I'm like, duh. I got Cavs like, tickets oh. and, and Morton's. What are you doing? You should be excited, right? Yeah, but it's the same. Dinner, golf, you know, wine, cigars. Like everybody does their relationship building the same way. And then they wonder why nobody cares about their dinner or the ball game or whatever else. It's not that there's anything wrong with it, but it goes back to like anniversaries, birthdays, Christmas. It's table stakes. Yeah. It, it's not, oh my gosh, I've never, never been to a steak dinner before. It's like, cool, maybe if I like you, I have a relationship, but but nobody's gonna be like, remember five years ago we had steaks? Like, <laughs> unless there's something memorable about it. And so on the spot, I'm like, Cameron, what else are you going to do in your town? He said, I'm going to go shop and the dollar is super weak compared to the Canadian dollar. And I'm thinking, this is my angle. I said, where at? And he said, Brooks Brothers. I love Brooks Brothers. So on the spot, I'm like, hey, um, Cameron, uh, I'm a Jose bank guy. What's your shirt size? I want to send a shirt. And we tell Cameron, like, almost took a step back. He's looking at me like a little bewildered. Like, does this guy have a man crush on me? Like, that's a weird question. Ask another man within two minutes of meeting. But he actually told me. So long story short is... I. The day where he's supposed to be coming in, he starts texting me, my flight's delayed, you just want to cancel. And I'm like, he's trying to get out of dinner in the ball game. So I went up to Brooks Brothers, put down the Amex, and I said, I want one of everything in your new fall collection, all your jackets, boots, belt, pants, everything. And it was $7,000, which seven, seven grand was like our entire month's marketing. Budget. Wow. So my partner, by the way, said, if this doesn't work, he just bought half the company. I sold half of the giftology and everything. And so everything I'm involved in is 50-50 now. He's like, if it doesn't work, it comes out of your personal draw all of a sudden. So like, there's a lot riding on this. You know, at the time, I wasn't taking a huge draw. Like, that would have been multiple months of draw. And uh, so can't, so we outfit his hotel room at the Ritz, like a Brooks Brothers store, jackets, suits, belts, pants. I'm down in the lobby bar drinking like a triple on the rocks. And I'm not a big drinker, but I was so nervous. And, can't, and Rod, my partner, is like, I can't believe you did it. This is so dumb. He's going to think you're a stalker. Like, this is the worst. So Cameron gets in. He doesn't want to go to dinner. He wants to go to bed. So I said, Cameron, go take a shower. Take your time. Come down here if you're ready. And he's like, okay, fine. Comes back down. His eyes are like the size of silver dollar. He's like, Don, whatever you want to talk about for as long as you want to talk about it, I've never had anybody that's made me feel this way. Wow. That'd be cool for him to walk into just because you're a good listener and heard he wants to shop at Brooks Brothers. And you have the whole store in his size laid out in his hotel room. Yeah, it looks like a Brooks Brothers store. He's taking pictures. He's, he's called, he called multiple authors to change the story of the best client experience that he's ever experienced. So like all of a sudden, like it became a ripple effect. And I didn't ask him for anything at the dinner. Like we went to dinner, the game was over by the time he got in. And uh, and people were, were like, yeah, I can't do seven grand. I said, well, here, there's two kickers. One is Cameron came back to me and said, John, like I couldn't take all those clothes with me. I picked out what I wanted. Either you're going to tell me how much they cost and I'm going to write you a check for that. Or I'm going to guess and round up by 50%. Mm -hmm. So that experience cost me zero. Now, most people stop after they have somebody. They stop once they're married and they have the girl or the yep. guy. They stop after they have the client and they start like, I don't, I, I'm not whale hunting. I'm just, I don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. The next decade is when I spent 25 grand wow. on the $12,000 knife set, the crazy wine tool, the mug, the, you name it. I ran out of things to give them. I actually sent them <laughs> an unmarked briefcase filled with cash, a dollar bills. And he opened it, money went everywhere. It was actually reported in his house in Scottsdale. Oh my gosh. He thought it was a drug deal. He <laughs> Facebook lied. It. He was like, this is the, like, and it wasn't about the money. He had plenty of money. It was about the, the story. But people are like, why would you invest 25 grand in a relationship you already had? And I'm like, when you show up for people when you don't have to is when they're inspired to go run through wall. So if you talk to Cameron, all 300 of his clients, he talks to Giftology, he sends the book. He, tell, he sends gifts to all of them. And the reason I landed went from begging to be on stage like six years ago. So literally like our biggest stage, you know, we'll get close to six figures for a one keynote. Wow. Um, when I was, when he got double booked before I had giftology the book, he would say, you need to book John Woolen. And the event organizer, CEO would be like, who's John Woolen? And he'd be like, just trust me. So my first 10,000, 15, 20,000 hours gigs, all these gigs came from Cameron going and advocating. So when I talk about ROR, it's not woo woo. It's not like no, nebulous it's numbers. It's real numbers. And so when people are like, why would you continue to do stuff? I'm like, I couldn't hire Cameron for one year yep. to be a sales rep for $2 million. But for $25,000 over a decade, I was able to get somebody to go sell on my behalf. And hit five of his words are more, worth more than 50,000 of mine. Yeah. To people that love and respect them. And that's where people don't understand. Like, you don't just give gifts to retain your clients. 
you love on them to inspire them to go like advocate and bring you more clients and talked about when you're not around, who, what are people saying about you? Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen oftentimes on accident no. by just like offering a good product and service is fine, but it's the little cherry on top of the Sundays here and there that people will tell the story about that. That, that becomes the story we're telling. That's how you get referrals without asking. Yeah, I, I love it. And it also creates that trickle down effect that you're talking about, right? Now someone else is inspired to be yeah. not just a giver, but a great giver or put creativity behind it. And then that inspires that person. That inspires, and it creates this great chain reaction of generosity and creativity that wouldn't be sparked otherwise. I've got to ask. I mean, here you are, twenty years into this. How does it feel to run a business whose entire ethos is just generosity and making people feel good and, and honoring special moments? It's got to feel great, huh? Yeah, man. I mean, I'm you know, like anybody, like when you have family and challenges and whatever else, like my dad passed away last year and you know, like everybody has challenges. So like, I don't want to paint a picture that like, you know, like I just ride on like, you know, unicorns and rainbows every day, like running a business can be difficult because you're like expectations rise and you have employees and challenges and COVID obviously all of our employees are remote. So they, they're homeschooling at the same time that they're fulfilling. So, but I mean, I'm a pretty happy dude because I get to go, you know, if you ask my four, my daughter who's 10 when she was four, what does your dad do? And she's like, uh, my dad helps people love on people. Oh, that's the coolest answer ever. That is really yeah, cool. I, that's got to make you proud. Oh, man. I mean, yeah, it makes me tear up. It makes me every time. I mean, I've, you know, told that story probably, you know, a few dozen times, but to me, like, you know, I, I feel super fortunate to be able to do what I do at the level that we do it at with the people that we get to do it at. And, and what's interesting, I mean, after doing it for 20 years, like people are like, man, like you just came out of nowhere. And I'm like, I've been doing like, I'm the, you know, it's like, it's the funny 20 year overnight success. And, but I do feel really fortunate. I don't take it for granted that what we get to do for who we get to do it for is a, you know, it's a blessing. It's fortunate. Like, um, and, uh, but I feel like I'm, in some ways I'm just getting started too in that same weird way. Cause I feel like, a lot has compounded in the last five years. You said you're just getting started. What is a big audacious dream you have for your mission or for your uh, company that you have not yet realized? Um, well, when we published Giftology, the book, the goal was to get a million leaders, like people that either lead a company, like they have influence, uh, a million, get a million leaders to be more radically generous with all of their relationships. And the book was one of those tools to be able to do that. Of course, you can do it from a stage or whatever else. And so we've sold, you know, 100,000 books mm-hmm. total. Congrats. That's a lot um, of books. So, People don't realize how hard it is to sell a book, by the way. Oh, it's crazy. I mean, 30,000 books are published every week on Amazon. Yep. 30,000. Yep. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's why we invested our first 50 copies that were made. By the way, we invested $250 per copy. They were in a leather bag inside a linen box and... People made fun of us for like, what you know, like you're going to go broke with your books. And I'm like, you don't understand. This is our Bible. Like most people go cheap when they should be going expensive. Yeah. And $250 doesn't even buy you a round of drinks in Vegas. Like, nope. like $250 for, but I send it to like Michael Hyatt and Darren Hardy. And actually Vaynerchuk was one of them. Is either people I loved, that is a client or respected. Yep. And, I think uh, Lewis got one too, someone. if I remember. Huh? I said, I think uh, Lewis got one too, if I remember. Lewis got, yeah. Yep. Lewis got one as well. Yeah. So, but people got, you know, like Michael Hyatt has a huge following. He's been in publishing for like 30 years. He's like, John, I get four or 5,000 books sent to me every year. I don't read any of them. They all go to Goodwill or they go to the library. He's like, I read your book. My wife, Gail, read your book and I bought 25 copies. So cool. Like, it's the nicest book I've ever seen. And the contents were actually amazing. Like it wasn't just like, a, you know, like people do judge a book by its cover, but they also like, you don't want it to be a business card. You want what's inside to be really valuable. So when we wrote the book, we try to follow our own principles and practice, but yeah, I mean, to get, if I can get a million people, not just to buy the book, but to read the book. And then like, you know, one of my mentors is Gary Chapman from the five love languages, you know, like he sold and he's been, you know, some, that same book has been sold for 30 years. It sold 22 million copies globally. Wow. I'm like, I don't need to get to 22 million. That'd be cool. But if I get to a million, that to me was like, rare air of like that was like a b-hag of like especially since it was self-published yep like people are like oh nobody's gonna care and i'm like you're right maybe maybe my grandma's the only one that's gonna buy this book i don't know um but uh but you know that's the, that's the big goal is to get a million leaders 
And the trickle down effect of that could be a couple hundred million people would be impacted by that leader and how they show up for their employees, their clients, their suppliers, everybody. I love that goal. I love that goal. I'll tell you, I mean, I can't get you the other 900,000, but if everybody listening, if, if you'll do me one favor, if you will share this episode and tag John and myself in it, just with a takeaway, something that made you feel good, something you learned, something you're going to do differently, just so, some way that the world's going to get a little bit better. If you just share the episode, tag John and I uh, with a takeaway. Um, I'll pick 20 of you at random to send books to. My team will send them out to you. So on Instagram, tag John. John, what's your Instagram? At, at John Rulin. All right, at John Rulin. Um, tag John and myself, and we'll just pick 20 of you at random and, and we'll send you books uh, from my team here. So now you're at 100,020. We have just a little <laughs> ways to go. So hopefully everyone else buys one. Where can they find the book? Amazon? Yeah, Amazon's the best place to uh, to buy the book. I mean, it's carried in some bookstores, whatever else. But in general, like most people on Audible, you know, Kindle, or um, uh, even, we don't sell paperbacks of the book. By the way, people are like, "Why should your paperback sell for like eighty seven dollars?" I'm like, because we only printed a certain run of them. I I don't I feel like a paperback makes it feel like a brochure. Yeah, and so I invest like three hundred percent more to print our books with a certain feel of the cover and the inside is lined a certain way because I'm like. It's Even experience. just a normal hardcover should feel different. Yep, it should look different. It should smell different. It should like I'm like I don't want to go cheap on those things because I want out of the 37 books somebody has on their stack, I want them to choose ours and to read it. And uh, and so it's so far it's worked. I love that. All right, so very last question. So I know that we're limited on time here. The show's tagline and ethos is when good people make good money, they can do great things. And obviously, at this point in your life, you're crushing it, and it's probably allowed you to do some great things for people. We know that you're a person who operates from generosity. So do one of those great things stand out to you? Is there something great you've been able to do with your success? Oh, I think that uh, anybody that has a platform, I feel like at least God's given me my platform to be able to share my faith and to put a spotlight on other people and pull them up with me. Yeah. And that could be a charity, you know, like Scott Harrison from Charity Water. We've done some amazing work with. Scott. He's a great friend. I don't necessarily need to start a charity, but it's great when you can leverage your influence and your platform, you know, to take a, an artist who nobody knows about. And now we're doing artwork, you know, for like Sarah and Jesse, you know, Bitzler with this crazy artwork that a gal named Lindsay Warner, who's just incredible. She was a state or she was a working mom selling advertising, hating her life. And now she's like five years later is making artwork for Sarah Blakely, one of the youngest billionaire women ever. So I feel like, I've been given a gift, you know, like no pun intended, to be able to be like a spotlight for other people. And that could be charities, it could be other small businesses, it could be other ideas. And so I get really excited about doing things like that and leveraging my influence to be able to not just give money myself, but like we were, we were at a mastermind a few years ago and with Jason Gaynor at Mastermind Talks, really great mastermind. And we just, you know, I, we decided that one of my best friends was how Elrod was fighting for his life from cancer. And I'm like, what if we raise money for the five ventures? Uh, they're working with prisons and, and how? And I asked a couple of my buddies like Cameron and Dave Asprey, whatever else, to donate a few things. And I, I, my background is in auctioneering. Uh, mm-hmm. my, my grandfather started an auctioneering business. And now I have like 40 cousins that are all in that business. I have mm-hmm. one of 68 cousins. My mom's one of 13 kids. So all farmers, all kind of, you know, like not like... You know, living in Bel Air, like sure, Ohio, sure. like, but um, great people. So anyway, we we in fifteen minutes we raised three hundred thousand dollars. Wow! Out of wow. thin air by just getting people to bid on things that were once in a lifetime experiences that everybody in that group could get access to. Wow. And you know, I didn't have to do anything other than aggregate the idea and then leverage the idea and put the spotlight on it and and let the magic kind of take over itself from there. So. You know, I don't have I don't have to be a billionaire in order to be able to run with billionaires, I and so that, I think that's that. my my thought process. I love that, and you don't have to be a billionaire in order to create billions of dollars worth of positive ripple through your network and these relationships that you built. What a great answer! What a great answer, John. I can't thank you enough for your time. I know how valuable it is for being on the show today. Um, everybody who's listening, share a takeaway. Tag John and I on Instagram. We'll pick twenty of you at random for my team to send a book to you. And uh, make sure you share this episode. Uh, be generous with this episode. Share this episode. And let's get John some, some great exposure out there as a thank you back to him. John, my friend, thanks for being on. I appreciate it. Thanks, man, for having me. 
Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.